Hello world! New data shows DDoS attacks saw quite the epic comeback in 2020, with some DDoS gangs even masquerading as notorious Russian hacking groups in order to spook their victims. That and more on this week's episode of The Week Web, where we explore the week's tech news but with a cybersecurity focus. I'm sure you're familiar with the not-so-humble DDoS attack. From mega multinationals to measly Minecraft servers, everyone knows of the damage that downtime due to a DDoS can cause. They've been around for so long as the internet has existed, though they've seen a resurgence in recent months. In particular, are DDoS attacks. These are DDoS attacks, but with a ransom element. A criminal would demand payment, usually in the form of Bitcoin, from an organization. And if they didn't pay up, well, then they'd ping them to death. Probably not using ping though, there are a lot more advanced DDoS attack vectors out there these days, but you get the idea. So why are DDoS attacks seeing a surge? Well, Akamai is a DDoS protection company. According to them, DDoS saw a surge right when lockdown started, part of the way through 2020. It's theorized that because so many people are having to work from home, they're dependent on company servers to do their jobs, and hence a DDoS attack to a company's backend is now a hell of a lot more damaging than it used to be. More damaging, of course, means more lucrative for criminals. DDoS attacks on financial services and education, which have been forced to go pretty much 100% online due to lockdowns, now see way higher proportions of DDoS attacks than they used to. Some criminal gangs are even posing as infamous Russian hacking groups, such as Fancy Bear, presumably in efforts to spook their victims into paying the ransom. Though in fairness, a cursory Google of Fancy Bear is enough to spook anyone. They're a Russian cyber espionage group thought to be behind a spate of attacks targeting Western governments and organizations. Also, notice how I refer to DDoSers as criminals, not, not hackers. DDoSing is a fairly simple affair these days, requiring nothing but access to hacking forums, some money to pay the botnet owner, and an IP to target. A low-skilled criminal can carry one out. You don't need to be a to be elite hacksaw to do a DDoS. This video is brought to you by my company, Maltronics. We sell an array of pen testing products, which are super cool, mind you. In fact, let's do a giveaway, because because why not? To win a Malduino W, which is the wireless bad USB, link to more info on the device in the description, by the way. To enter, just leave a thoughtful comment down below on one of the news stories in this video. Winner will be announced on my Instagram story 48 hours after this video goes live, or just check back and I'll pin the winning comment. If you don't win, you can still get 10% off everything over over at Maltronics with discount code SATONIC. In other news, Graphica, a social media research group, has uncovered a network of Twitter accounts engaged in a propaganda campaign criticizing the Belgian government's decision to ban Huawei from their 5G network. In case you've been living under a rock for the past year, and I wouldn't blame you, you haven't really been missing out on much, governments all over the West have been banning Huawei from supplying 5G equipment due to concerns of the Chinese government having way too much control over the company. Belgium is only the latest country to do so. These FACO Twitter accounts would often link to articles sponsored by Huawei themselves. Other times, the articles would have the same headline, but be posted across multiple platforms. This all hints at fake news articles lazily plastered across the interwebs in order to act as a propaganda campaign. Tweets from the bots were retweeted dozens of times by official Huawei accounts. Interestingly though, the Twitter accounts all seemed to have used profile pictures generated by AI. The research group collated all of the profile pictures of the Twitter accounts and superimposed them on top of each other. Notice how the eyes line up perfectly from every picture. This is a great sign that these pictures are AI generators and in fact aren't real photographs of real people. Fun fact, you can head over to thispersondoesnotexist.com and every time you refresh the page, you'll see a new face generated by AI networks. These people don't exist in the slightest, yet it's impossible for a layman to discern this. IMO, it's really trippy and somewhat unsettling to see pictures of people that don't exist, especially when they're this good. There is also a thishorsedoesnotexist.com, but it's not quite as good. I mean, what is that? The thing is eating the dude. The, the horse has tentacles. Anyway, all the Twitter accounts involved in the propaganda campaign have since been suspended. The research group didn't conclude who was controlling these accounts, though I'll leave speculation on that up to your imagination. Huawei said in a statement that it had started an internal investigation to try and find out exactly what has happened and if there has been any inappropriate behavior. Next up, a Google researcher has discovered a new security system hidden within the depths of iOS. Apple have been getting a lot of negative press lately over a zero-click vulnerability in their iMessages app. This vulnerability has allowed attackers to install backdoors on vulnerable iPhones without the need for any interaction from the victim. This was exactly how 36 journalists in the Middle East were hacked last year. It is alleged Saudi and UAE governments used spyware bought from NSO Group to hack their victims. Now, if you ever needed a poster boy for 
for an allegedly evil hacking firm, NSO Group would fit the bill. They sell zero-day vulnerabilities, often in the form of their spyware package Pegasus, to governments purportedly for use in fighting criminals and other assorted naughty people. Though often their tools seem to fall into the hands of governments with less than respectable human rights records. Fun fact, Facebook is suing NSO Group, alleging they helped hack WhatsApp and installed backdoors onto 1,400 mobile phones in order to conduct surveillance. Anyway, sorry I got carried away there. Back to that new security system. This new security system the Google researcher discovered is called Blast Door. It acts as a sandbox for all incoming communications through iMessage. Previously in iOS, when a message was received, it was decompressed and passed in an insecure way that meant if an attacker could inject malicious code, the code would have access to the main iOS environment. Now, messages are decompressed and passed in a sectioned off area called Blast Door, which acts as a sandbox, meaning if malicious code did make its way into the system somehow, it would have restricted access to things like file system interactions, network access, etc. Whilst the sandbox doesn't guarantee no exploit will get through, it is a strong additional layer of security, which separates potential threats from the rest of iOS. I'll link the full technical blog post in the description, of course, in case you're smart enough to understand it, or if, like me, you enjoy being confused. In conclusion, he describes how he was quite impressed at the lengths Apple have gone to in allocating resources towards security. In other Apple news, and this is an interesting one, good guy Apple is de facto killing off targeted ads in the Apple ecosystem. You may have heard about some new changes coming to iOS. These additions, which I'll explain in just a second, are great for privacy, but really, really, really bad news for Facebook and other companies which rely on being able to serve you targeted ads based on your interests and behavior. You see, currently every iPhone has an IDFA, or Identifier for Advertisers, which is enabled by default. This makes it super easy for companies to try you as you hop between apps, learning about your behavior and interests in order to serve you better, more targeted ads. As it stands, to opt out of tracking, you need to delve deep into your settings and manually flick a switch somewhere. However, an update coming to iOS early spring is going to make opting out of tracking as easy as opting out of location sharing. Now, when an app wants to track your usage, you'll get a pop-up that looks something like this, asking if you want to give the green light for a given app to snoop on you. As you can imagine though, Facebook really really aren't too pleased about this. Their whole business model is built around showing users targeted ads. Currently, it's quite easy for them to collect data about you, but according to Facebook insiders, it's estimated that only 20% of people are going to agree to targeted tracking when these new changes take place. This is awfully bad for Facebook, so much so that Facebook have set up a dedicated webpage in which they praise the wonders of targeted ads and how helpful they are to small businesses. Funnily enough, they're spinning this as something that will be really detrimental to those small Small businesses and that it'll make it incredibly difficult for them to reach potential customers via ads. There's a lot of short videos and quotes from small companies on the page, though nowhere here do they allude to the facts that Facebook themselves will be one of the biggest casualties of this new change. Facebook also took out a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal in which they claim they're standing up to Apple for small businesses everywhere. It's rumored that Facebook may be prepping an antitrust lawsuit against Apple over this whole situation. Exactly what that lawsuit would look like would be interesting to see, though it wouldn't come as much of a shock. Spotify recently launched their own assault against Apple. The EU has since opened up antitrust investigations into Apple based on that. Also, Epic Games is famously suing Apple over its App Store practices. Exactly where this will end, it's impossible to say, though it'll be interesting to watch. Next up, in a recent video, I explained how Google may be forced to ban the whole of Australia from having access to Google search itself. Why? Well, the Aussie government wants to introduce a funny new law which would force Google to pay websites just for linking to them. But you'll have to go and watch my previous video for an explanation on that. Anyway, more bad news for Australians. The Australian Prime Minister has been speaking to the Microsoft CEO, and it turns out that Microsoft are significantly interested in the market opportunity a Google exit would provide. This this further complicates the whole situation for Google as it further emboldens the politicians that want to see that new law go through. It shouldn't be too surprising that Microsoft are sucking up to politicians here. After all, Bing represents less than 4% of Australian search traffic. Microsoft have got nothing to lose but everything to gain from a Google exit. Sure, they'd have to pay Australian news sites in order to link to them, but the money they'd make from more than 10xing their search traffic in the region would more than make up for it. So guys, make sure to check out the Malduino W, linked below, and leave a thoughtful comment on one of the stories in this video to enter that giveaway. Sorry for no Mitty Fotty this week, I was super late to making this week's episode and really just couldn't find anything mildly interesting enough. Though I hope you enjoyed the video all the same, stay tuned for more hanging videos, and have a good one.